So hello and welcome to today's webinar. For anybody who hasn't met me before, I'm Hazel and I'm the course advisor for our part-time online analytical chemistry and measurement science program. I'm here to facilitate today's session and outside of today's webinar as well, I'm your first point of contact for any further information that you need about our part-time online analytical chemistry and measurement science course. At the end of today's webinar, I will share my contact details as well if you do want to contact me and follow up with any further questions that you have. I'm delighted today that we have a packed session. I'm looking forward to introducing you to some of the academic team behind analytical chemistry and measurement science. For anybody who has attended our webinars before, um, you will have seen in the past that it's often myself and our course director, Dr. Rashila Moodley, who you hear from. But today we're giving Rashila a little bit of a break um, and we're introducing you to Mike, Purdy, Nick and Drupad, who are all part of the teaching team on this programme. So during today's session, each of our speakers is going to introduce themselves and explain a little bit about their academic background and their area of expertise. They'll give you a short overview into the unit or units where you can meet them during your studies. You may have seen on our advertising that we were also hoping to be joined by Professor Jonathan Wolfe, but unfortunately he's not able to join us um, today. But if there are any questions that you have that he would normally have answered, we will follow those up after today's webinar. After each of our presentations, I'm going to give you a little bit of a brief reminder of the course itself, a bit of an overview of the different units as well, before we open it for the question and answer session. If you do have any questions or want to get in touch with us throughout today's webinar, we do have the Q&A function in Zoom open, so you can submit those questions at any time. Um, and there is also the chat function as well, which is available for um, myself and our panel to see. So I'm now going to hand over to Mike to begin our presentations. Hello, welcome everybody. So as Hazel mentioned, my name is Michael Baker. I uh, teach the X-ray techniques unit along with Alex Walton. I'm an inorganic chemist and spectroscopist, specifically an X-ray and neutron spectroscopist. I'm affiliated with the Department of Chemistry here at Manchester and also the University of Manchester at Harwell. Okay. So what's the University of Manchester at Harwell? Well, this is um, the UK national and international facilities for synchrotron X-rays and um, neutron generation. So uh, this uh, includes diamond light source and the um, ISIS neutron source. Um, this facility is based down in Oxford, which is some distance from Manchester, which is why the University of Manchester exists. It's, um, si it's situated at the campus where diamond and um, ISIS are, and then researchers that are conducting lots of experiments using these facilities can be close to the facilities all year round. So um, I use both neutrons and x-rays in my research and as part of this analytical um, unit um, we will, if you go ahead for this course, learn a lot about um, x-ray methods. So this includes X-ray spectroscopies, which are um, really my speciality, and also X-ray diffraction and um, X-ray fluorescence. So um, in part of my research um, using X-rays, we're interested in synchrotron X-rays because you can tune the energy, and this gives you a very precise, elementally specific probe uh, of electronic structure and um, geometric structure. So in this periodic table that you can see, um, it's color coded with the different characteristic absorption edges, which are unique for every element. So for analytical science, you will be able to appreciate how useful this is, since if you have an analyte with um, unknown species, you can lock into specific elements present and start probing electronic structure. So um, our work um, in, on the research side of things is to develop new X-ray spectroscopy, spectroscopy techniques um, to um, understand the electronic structure and bonding of complex chemical systems. Okay, next slide, please. 
So one of the, the, the big issues with this type of um, spectroscopy has historically meant that you require a synchrotron, so an, an accelerator of electrons, and these are expensive, they're distributed all around the world, but people generally need to travel to them. Um, and there's been a bit of a paradigm shift recently in that it's now become possible that you can do these types of measurements in the lab too. So while we travel, and I have a map here um, of Europe showing the different um, user facilities that we travel to, which are accessible to both industrial and, um, and academic users, and I show the synch three synchrotrons that we visit frequently, so diamond light source, which I said previously, um, it, the European synchrotron radiation facility and synchrotron Soleil are three that we go to a lot. But I think the important thing here in terms of state-of-the-art knowledge is that many of these X-ray absorption and um, extended X-ray absorption fine structure methods are now coming to the laboratory. And in the middle, I show an instrument by SIGRAY, which is one of the companies, along with Easy XFs and others, that are now producing these types of spectrometers, enabling them to come to the lab. So you'll learn some in, with this unit some very state-of-the-art analytical method that, that should be predominant in, in, in the future within the laboratory. Okay, next slide, please. So going into a little more detail, what we're particularly interested in, um, in my research group, the, one of the areas is uranium and actinide electronic structure. So we... Um, use very new spectroscopic methods that provide um, much higher energy resolution. So on the left here, I show a X-ray absorption spectrum of a, a uranyl compound in black. And with a new method known as high energy resolution fluorescence detection, we obtain much higher energy resolution. As you can see in red, there is all this fine structure that can now be obtained, which previously was inaccessible. So that's an, that's an experimental method that, that measures the unoccupied, um, lowest unoccupied molecular orbitals. And then on the right is a method that probes the, um, the highest occupied molecular orbitals. And we put that information together to get a very um, detailed insight into um, electronic structure and bonding. Next slide, please. Another area we're interested in are um, rare earth alternatives. So we've been looking on the top right here is an iron doped lithium nitride, which is a, um, a transition metal compound. Um, so just iron doped in a lithium nitride crystal that exhibits large magnetic coercivity that is um, competitive with that of rare earth um, magnets. So rare earth um, magnets are, um, or the, the presence of rare earths in, in, in permanent magnets is vital for um, the um, for electricity generation and um, for the functionality of, ele of electric motors and are uh, um, in great demand. However, um, there is a paucity of availability of rare earths and the mining is, it can be uh, very, very detrimental to the environment. So an alternative is to try to find transition metal, iron, for instance, examples, which also exhibit the desirable magnetic properties that rare earths um, hold. So um, that's my research, um, the end of the research side. So let's talk a bit more about the, um, the actual unit itself, the X-ray techniques units. So next slide. So um, as I mentioned, the, the unit uh, is broken down into subsections. It's taught by myself, uh, Michael Baker, along with Alex Walton. Alex Walton in this picture here is stood behind a X-ray photo emission spectrometer, which he is a, um, an expert in um, and, has, um, and runs facilities in X-ray photo emission spectroscopy at Manchester. Um, the unit begins with um, fundamentals of X-rays before moving on to um, X-ray diffraction and crystallography, which is a subject that I, I um, teach here at Manchester. Um, before then going into X-ray absorption and emission spectroscopy, and that includes some of what my um, real research uh, interest um, overlaps very strongly with. Then um, X-ray fluorescence, which is a very important um, laboratory-based um, workhorse and can even be conducted out in the, out in the, in the field. Uh, and finally, photo emission spectroscopy. Um, how will you be assessed? So um, 
initially for the fundamentals, the, along with um, some uh, um, tutorials and um, formative assessments, the um, the the assessed uh, side of things include initially some multiple choice questions, um, some presentation where you will pitch different ideas concerning the most um, suitable experimental techniques for solving difficult analytical problems and you can you can bring along problems of your own perhaps um, scientific questions that come from your workplace um, and then finally um, we will um, aid you in being able to write your own proposal to get access to um, a user facility to be able to answer really um, answer really tricky questions in analytical science again, where you can choose a scientific subject of your own. That's it, thank you, Hazel. Thank you very much, Mike. And um, over to you now, please, Purdy. Hello, good to meet you all. I'm sorry, I'm just organizing my tech. Um, so I'm Purdy Tabaran. I'm a professor of mass spectrometry at the University of Manchester. Um, and I'm also um, an alumni of the University of Manchester. I, I studied here in, in the last century. Um, and I have a research group here um, and we do lots of different things with mass spectrometry, um, including using it to measure the mass of intact viruses and using it with my colleague, Drupa Trivedi, who's going to talk to you in a bit, to help to find biomarkers to, to diagnose Parkinson's disease. Next slide, please. So um, if you were to join this course, you would be learning mass spectrometry. It's one of the core units, and it's a tremendously good place to learn about mass spectrometry because the history of mass spectrometry in Manchester goes back a really long way. Uh, John Dalton, is a, a native of this city and he was really the first scientist who was able to look at um, atoms and think that the atoms may be able to be arranged in a way that was proportional to their relative atomic weight and this was about 40 years before any understanding of, of, of or sorry, any development towards the periodic table but it started to he started to organize um, atoms in that way. Later, Edwin Franklin started to understand valence and atomic valence, and that's had great um, impact across chemistry, but, but in particular in, um, in our understanding of molecular and atomic structure. And then um, another alumni of Manchester was J.J. Thompson, who was most commonly known for discovery of the electron, which he did do at Cambridge, but also he, um, with Francis Aston, built the first mass spectrometer that existed and, and in those days he and, and scientists in general were very interested in understanding atomic structure of course he, he discovered the electron um, using such an instrument but um, the instrument that he built with Aston uh, which was made of glass not like the mass spectrometers we have these days was made of glass um, was then used to um uh, to, to actually help to understand isotopes and Aston um, in 1922 received the Nobel Prize for the discovery of isotopes, which I think really is the first Nobel Prize um, for mass spectrometry. Rutherford also attended Manchester University and, and he, um, working under the mentorship of, of Thompson, um, discovered both the nuclear, the atomic nucleus and, and, and the proton. James Tra Chadwick, who worked with him, who was his student, discovered the neutron. And so in Manchester, we really like to say that we kind of own the atom because the three individuals there and the teams of scientists working with them and the instruments that they use to make those measurements all contributed to, to our early understanding of atomic structure. Along the while, in, in 1940, um, of course, that was when the um, Second World War was occurring. And there was a great need to use mass spectrometry. And Chadwick, who was um, at that time working at the University of Liverpool, was asked by the British government if he could commission commercially from a company called Metropolitan Vickers, who were making various um, machines at that time, a commercial mass spectrometer. So this was the first commissioning of a commercial mass spectrometer. And at the time, the British government wanted it to separate radioactive elements um, and you can I'm sure when well, you could perhaps discuss it in the discussion afterwards why people would want to do that in, in 1940 but 
he in that um, commission to Metropolitan Vickers, he said such an instrument might also be useful for the study of hydrocarbons. And indeed, that is in, in what, what most mass spectrometry is used for today. Um, also working in, in, in commercial uh, mass spectrometry in, in, in the Manchester area, John Bynion worked on the first commercially available tandem mass spectrometer. And later, uh, someone called Michael Barber, known as Nicky Barber, um, in 1981, discovered a method which is known as fast atom bombardment, or FAB, to ionize molecules. And that method really transformed the way we could use mass spectrometry because he showed, and people in his team showed, that you could use FAB, an ionization method, to put intact large molecules, as large as, as um, insulin, the protein in, in our bodies, into a mass spectrometer. That was tremendously important. FAB has mostly now been superseded by a, a better ionization technique called electrosphere ionization, which um, was um, discovered by uh, Lydia Ball in, in, in Russia and also John Fenn in the United States. But but um, John By uh, sorry, but uh, Mickey Barber really showed that that could be done and really really helped to to make people think that mass spectrometry could be used to look as, at as larger things as, as protons, uh, proteins, and biomolecules. There have been other commercial developments in the Greater Manchester area. A type of mass spectrometer known as the quadrupole time of flight was invented in Manchester, and that's a very, very common form of mass spectrometry. The Orbitrap mass spectrometer, which is a relatively new type of mass analyzer, was um, uh, put together in Manchester by someone called Sasha Makarov. And uh, commercial iron mobility mass spectrometry was also developed in Manchester. So this fantastic timeline of inventions and, and people who contributed to those inventions, um, it, it just shows you the heritage of, of mass spectrometry in our city. Next slide, please. So in this course, you will learn, and I've put, put some pictures of mass spectrometers there, these are sort of commercially available ones, and that you can see them, and they all just kind of look like plastic boxes, don't they? Well, what you're going to learn is about what's inside the boxes. You're going to learn about the fundamentals of mass spectrometry and how we now apply it to the analysis of chemicals and, and biological materials. You're going to learn about the different components of a mass spectrometer. It all consists of an ionization source, I've mentioned a few in, in that introduction, and they all consist of some form of iron optics, which are a little bit like light optics, but they're used to focus and move ions through the instrument. And you will look, and they also all consist of a, a mass analyzer and some form of detection system. And you will learn about those components and the ways in which mass spectrometers can be um, operated to allow you to do, well, the way I call it is to allow you to play with molecules, to allow you to find out what they are. We'll learn about the common methods of ionization and how to best choose the right method for the sort of compound you want to analyze. And as mentioned, you'll learn about the fundamental physics that allows us to manipulate ions when we put them into these boxes. We will talk a lot about hyphenated mass spectrometry and, and um, Nick Lockyer, here, my colleagues, are going to talk to you about the first part of that. But we talk about how we couple chromatography to mass spectrometry, which is really, really ubiquitous and is the way in which most people will encounter mass spectrometry in, in their working um, research lives. We'll learn about how we perform experiments known as tandem mass spectrometry experiments, where we first might use the first part of a mass analyzer to pre-select only ions of one master charge and use the second part to look at the fragments that happen if we, if we break that molecule up. And we'll learn how that gives us better diagnostic information to tell us what the molecule is. And most importantly, we will teach you the skills that you need to interpret spectra and how to apply that to a wide range of biological and chemical samples. We use examples that are taken from colleagues here at the University of Manchester who synthesize molecules. So we have real molecules and real mass spectra taken from research samples, and you have to um, learn how to interpret them and learn how they look. Next slide, please. So how will you be assessed? Um, one of the main parts of an assessment is um, 
project uh, is to think about what you're going to learn. And quite early on, I asked people to write an essay on a, on a really exciting development in mass spectrometry, something that's been transformative. And get people to look at that and write it in the style of a, of a journalist, of a news and news article. So how you would tell your grandmother or your best friend something about what, what, what mass spectrometry can do. You will also be tested on how to interpret mass spectrometry data and which form of ionization to use. Quite uniquely, you will learn how to use a really powerful um, computer program called SimION, which simulates the trajectories of ions in, in mass spectrometers. And then in doing that, you'll learn how the mass spectrometer works from the viewpoint of an ion. And that really, really helps in, in terms of understanding both the geometry and also the way in which we apply voltages to the different elements to best transmit, to best detect a given an ion of a given master charge. And similar to, uh, as described by my, my colleague, Mike Baker, you will be assessed on a pitch, um, which you will build um, to pitch for, to your workplace or to your imaginary workplace for a, a commercially available mass spectrometer. So something you could potentially buy now and why you might need it and why you need that mass spectrometer, what's it about? So you'll actually learn how to, to persuade colleagues why you might want to um, buy a particular mass spectrometer. And to put that into context, mass spectrometers cost anywhere between 150 and uh, 1.5 million pounds. So that sort of pitch is, is quite exciting and, and, and happens in, in workplaces across the world. Okay, I, I think that's all for me and I hope to have a chance to talk to you um, at the end. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Ferdy. <clears throat> I think I'm next up. So my name is is Nick Lockyer, um, and I'm teaching on the uh, on separation science um, unit within the course. Next slide, please, Hazel. So um, I'm not a sort of native of Manchester, unlike um, some of the colleagues that that Ferdy has previously mentioned. Um, I was born a little bit further south near Oxford. Um, I came to Manchester. Um, principally for two reasons. So if we can move forward the next two slides, Hazel, we'll see two of those reasons coming up. Um, so I actually joined the uh, University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, UMIST, which is one of the founding institutions of what is now the University of Manchester. Um, shortly after the, this, this gentleman shown here, Alex Ferguson, um, came to the city to, ma to manage Manchester United. So uh, the fact that Manchester has the greatest football team in the world, and um, also shown below there, some of the greatest live music acts in the world it was one of the, the reasons that I, that I came to the area. Um, and I, I'm still here now. So I, I progressed through um, my PSC, uh, my first degree, my PhD, uh, a, a special research fellowship that I took in, in the kind of analytical chemistry area, all at UMIST. And then as we merged into a university, I became a lecturer and now a professor of physical chemistry. Um, and although, as we'll see, my research interests are mostly in an application of mass spectrometry, um, I've been teaching separation science within the university for about 15 years and uh, currently the head of the, the physical chemistry teaching section. Next slide, please, Hazel. So um, a couple of slides about my research interests. So really um, what I'm most interested in is developing technologies and instrumentation uh, which are capable of generating um, surface surface chemical maps. So a little bit like, like doing some sort of microscopy, um, but using chemistry rather than, than photons. So using techniques that are based on mass spectrometry, we were able to probe the surface and indeed the, the subsurface regions of, of very complex materials, and therefore identify um, the changes in the chemistry as we go through these materials in, in terms of depth and also across the the surface in two dimensions. So this involves bombarding these materials as shown in the cartoon in the center of the screen, bombarding these materials with what we call primary ions, a little bit like the fast atom bombardment method that Purdy mentioned previously, um, to, to knock off or eject um, secondary ions, which are characteristic of, of the surface chemistry. Those could be simple um, atomic ions, or it could be quite complex um, some molecular ion species. And then we measure those um, mass to charge ratios using a mass spectrometry technique, typically a, a time of flight method as shown in the, in the cartoon on the left. So depending on the mass of the ions, they take a different time to fly through a flight tube and be detected at the far end. 
And because we can focus this primary iron beam into a small area and then move it across the surface, we can, we can get very spatially localized information, a spatially resolved um, mass spectral image we, we determine. And then in, in the bottom of the slide here to the right, you'll see a, a, what we call a depth profile. So here we're actually looking through a smart screen display. So this is like your, your mobile phone screen. And on the left hand side of the plot, you see the surface chemistry. And as you go deeper into the into the device, uh, revealing the underlying surface chemistry and many advanced materials, including um, OLEDs that these um, smartphones are, are based on, the screens are based on, they're, they're very dependent on the detailed arrangement of chemistry in 2D and in 3D. And so it's very important to be able to measure um, this distribution, both in order to ensure the kind of quality of these products and to develop new and more advanced and, and, and better performing materials, but also to be able to pick up defects and understand um, how these defects can impair the performance of these devices. So that's an example in the concept of sort of uh, advanced materials chemistry. Uh, next slide, please. Hazel, but we often apply it also um, in, in a biological context. And here we see some examples of, of data from our lab of, um, of cancer cells. So when you have um, a, a cancer in a, in a hard to reach area, for instance, a, a brain tumor, um, rather than just um, doing surgery and, and, and taking out the, the affected tissue, these are often treated by more um, less invasive techniques such as sort of um, uh, a, a sort of radiation based method. And so here it's important to put um, radiotherapy drugs into localized areas and then to target that radiotherapy so that only the tumor regions are affected and destroyed by the radiotherapy and the surrounding uh, more healthy tissue is not affected so much. So we were able to take samples of human brain tumor from, um, from volunteers and explore what the localization of one particular um, drug, which contains a boron atom in this case, was in, in these samples. And so in these two rows of, of images, you can see um, mass resolved images, um, CN, carbon C, phosphorus, boron, and boron carbide images from either control samples in the top row of data and on the bottom row of data, a drug sample. And so the boron containing species, the boron 10, the boron 10 carbide, are localized only to the drug treated samples. And this is information you can't obtain by other um, methods such as electron imaging, which we show on the right. You can get a nice sort of morphology image of the cell there, but you can't really get the chemistry out. So my research, as I said, is about the application and, and development of new technologies to, to really aid in a wide range of applications. Next slide, please, Hazel. So turning to the separation science unit, which I, I teach on this unit. So separation science is about separating, identifying, and then measuring the concentrations of components within very complex samples. So it's applied in a very wide range of, of industries and a very wide range of, of scientific research. So a few examples that I've shown here from, from the Journal of Separation Science, just some front cover articles that I picked out. Um, so in, in the food industry, for instance, the food and drink industry, it may be important to try to measure and quantify and identify certain kind of flavoring um, ingredients, for, for instance, in beer here. Um, and in the center image, we see an example of how it can be important in environmental analysis. So in detecting nitrates, um, and fluoride and chlorine um, in, in a water system and how that can impact on the, on the ecosystem. And then obviously in, in the sort of medical developments, it's very important to be able to deal with, with complex samples. And this is where separation science using methods such as chromatography is often coupled with mass spectrometry for more specific, more sensitive, um, more informative measurement of detailed things like drug metabolism at very low concentration levels in complex samples such as biofluids and tissues and individual cells. So a very wide range of applications um, spanning industry uh, and also scientific research. Next slide, please, Hazel. So in this course, um, you will be exploring some of the theory, the underlying principles of methods of separation science, principally column chromatography, mostly gas chromatography, and liquid chromatography. And we'll look at the kind of methods involved and, and how those can be optimized for a particular 
applications and then looking at some current applications of these methods in, in a wide range of different areas. So you have access to an electronic textbook, which provides some of the theory, uh, lots of on interactive online content, um, including simulation software. So you'll be doing some virtual lab experiments where um, you'll be set a task and you'll be running virtually using this simulation software shown in the center of the screen. Um, the sort of method development to try to optimize the separation of various components. And then importantly, we will bring this up to, up to date with some of the latest research. So you will be able to delve into some of the research literature, identify articles that are interesting or, or particularly kind of relevant to your, your place of work or your interests, and then relate the course content to the very latest developments in the field. And then part of the assessment will involve you writing short summary articles um, of some of the research that's currently being done and linking that with the, with the course count content that you've learned. And we have plenty of formative exercises and tutorials to support you in all of this. Um, so that's it for separation science. Thank you, Hazel. That's great. Thank you very much, Nick. Um, and thanks, Purdy, for your earlier presentation as well. I'm going to hand over to Drew Pat now. Hi. Um, so my name is uh, Drupa Trivedi, and I'll, uh, I'm, I lead the chemometrics unit, which is one of the uh, optional units uh, in the course. Uh, I teach on multiple courses apart from this one. Uh, so I teach in School of Chemistry as well as Biology within uh, the University of Manchester, and uh, it kind of reflects the multidisciplinary research interest my group also has. So I'm based in uh, the Manchester Institute of Biotechnology, where we use lots of analytical methods uh, to look at lots of biological as well as chemical systems. Uh, what my group is really interested in is measuring small molecules, like uh, Professor Barron said earlier. And we look at these molecules uh, in biological systems. Uh, but the cool part of the entire research is what's the point in looking and measuring things with such high resolution instruments? if we can't really mine the data. So you might have heard of chat GPT, right? Uh, everything that's get, getting cooler or nicer uh, in, in a sense of mining stuff is all reliant on data. Uh, and that's what my group is really interested in, is uh, how do we use the chemical data to make better models that can predict a chemical system. Now that system can be embedded within uh, in a wastewater. It could be something that's embedded in soil samples or it could be something that's in a biological system. Uh, but these chemical reactions happen all the time. And can we use the measurement data that uh, all the three academics before me are showing you with three different, very different techniques? Uh, can we use these data to try and build predictive models of something happening before it happens? Uh, so that's what mostly chemometrics unit covers. Uh, we look at uh, something called metabolomics, uh, which is study of small molecules. And uh, just like any other techniques, uh, we, we measure lots of different chemicals. So I've, I've given a representation figure here on the top where you see uh, Excel spreadsheet where you've seen lots of columns here. And this might represent something you measure in your day-to-day -day life or you might have seen it before. So we measure lots of features or lots of chemicals in our data. Uh, let's assume it's measured on say an X-ray technique or a high resolution mass spectrometer, probably hyphenated to one of the separation techniques like chromatography. And in each of the cases, you measure some sort of response from the instrument because you detect that analyte. And you might do it iteratively over lots of samples. Uh, here I've shown four of going up to N. But depending on the size of your experiments, you tend to collect lots of data. So within chemometrics, the idea is to extract the information from this sort of metrics of your measurements uh, and try and build uh, data-driven models uh, from this data. So you interrogate, the, you interrogate this data using lots of statistical computing. Uh, so within this uh, particular unit, what you learn is one of the languages called R. And what you will do is you'll try and build model on data that you probably haven't seen, but lots of example data from real experiments. And uh, while you learn the statistics uh, that are relevant to interrogate different types of data, what you'll also learn is how you can visualize this data to understand what's going on within the system better as well. Uh, in this unit, what we also do is, uh, what you see in the picture here, is we learn how to write these things in codes as well. So a simple code, which is shown in uh, this particular scenario, a dot chart, can create a scatter plot for you, 
for example, and all it needs is one line of code with three different commands. And we learn through these things uh, in the unit. And the reason we learn to do different kind of analysis and visualization by code is because it's more modular and you can do things uh, with your data, which is not restricted by a software. Uh, so by the end of the unit, what happens is you go through different kind of data types, you go through different type of chemical data that you measure using all the different units you have gone through before. And all this real data is interrogated for their statistical significance and to see if the data actually means anything. Because you could have high resolution mass spectrometer and you could measure lots of analytes, lots of chemicals in a really good uh, experiment that you've set up. But without any kind of statistical significance to the data, it's pretty much meaningless and you can't reproduce it. So we looked at how we can find these reproducible signatures within our data and then visualize it using codes. So by the end of the unit, you'll be able to perform analysis right from the scratch on your own data and also on the data sets that have been provided as example. Uh, next slide, please. So what do you learn in this unit? So over the 10 weeks, uh, we start off with very basic concepts and very basic studies of statistics. Uh, we talk about things that you might be already familiar. So we we'll talk about significance testing and t-test that you might have heard of or done it in your uh, previous life. But what we also talk about is also complex experimental design. So we try and think of statistical or mathematical ways to design an experiment where you don't have to analyze something over a repeated number of measurements because although we are going towards uh, high resolution, new techniques, hyphenated techniques where we generate complex data, you're also going towards the area where we have experiments that cost a lot of money. So can we try and design experiments where you don't have to really run the sample, but you can predict what will be the best combination of parameters that you can use. So you don't have to run 10,000 samples, you only have to run 30 or 40 of them. And by doing so, we can uh, think of uh, designing a really robust experiment, which is what we go through in one of the uh, weeks uh, in this course. And gradually towards uh, the end of learning the concept, what we do is we learn on looking at the data uh, in terms of what structure it has. So we look at the data in terms of not just chemicals, but rather look at the numerical structure of these data. And then slowly we start learning to code. So we'll go through something called our studio, uh, where I've designed interactive exercises. So it goes through uh, teaching you while you are coding as well. Uh, and it seems to be rather popular during the course. So from our week four, you start getting, uh, you start doing things practically uh, on your own laptop. Uh, we go through a few tutorials where you can bring your own data and we, you apply the same techniques and same knowledge you're learning on your own data in real life while you're learning what's on Blackboard already. And then slowly we start uh, going into the machine learning and AI part of the things where the whole chat GPT comes in. So you're then starting to think of uh, a way of building your own little chat GPT for your own uh, chemical data. So given that you have performed lots of experiments, eventually somewhere down the line, you might have little own machine learning model that predicts from your chemical data it's learned from. And uh, finally, in the last week, uh, we learn about your own data, some data that I've given from real life scenarios we have produced in our labs. And together what you do is you interrogate that data right from the scratch from an Excel spreadsheet into nice pretty graphs, all by using codes. Uh, and the reason you need to do this or reason you should be interested in this course is because of this little line chart you're seeing on this slide is roughly about last 10 years is when you can see that use of chemometrics or use of machine learning has started picking up in analytical chemistry. So it, might not be primed for analytical chemistry and machine learning yet, but imagine these, uh, the graph going up in the next 15 or 20 years, where you will see that we'll be using our data more smartly and we'll be using it in a way that we don't think about yet. And this unit probably puts you in the right place because you start interrogating and in embedding machine learning uh, into your workspace. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, yeah, and finally, in terms of assessment, so while you're doing this, you're continuously being sort of assessed. So every week, what you do is you write a reflective blog of how you are developing and learning new skills in this course. Uh, but what you also do is you do knowledge check MCQs, which are formative assessment. Uh, and in between these two things, uh, you try and see how much you are adding value each week as you go. In terms of summative assessment, uh, there are tasks uh, throughout the 10 weeks where you analyze statistical data, you make meaningful assumptions and uh, interpretation from it, and you write a one or two page report on that particular data set explaining what you've done and what the result means. 
Uh, and the idea is by the end of 10 weeks, you should be able to read a relatively complex statistical or chemometrics paper and be able to interpret what the author was trying to say. And that's one of the assessments you also do. Uh, what I've done in this slide is I've put some of the Blackboard comments that I've got from uh, previous cohorts. And as you can see that students on this unit particularly are from very different backgrounds. Some who had some uh, experience of statistics or chemometrics, some had some experience of code and some had no experience of coding as well. Uh, however, different concepts have struck different students very differently. And these comments reflect how some of the things they were doing routinely, uh, but was never as a concept of statistics or chemometrics, uh, but now it makes more sense. Uh, so I hope that these comments from our past students uh, gives a broad overview of what the value of this unit is within this course. Uh, and, but that's pretty much it. So I so, um, done. Yeah, thank you, Drew Pads. Um, so thank you to all of our um, academic team who've just presented um, as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm just going to give you um, a little bit of a brief reminder of the analytical chemistry and measurement science course itself and just show you the different units that make up the programme. So today we featured four of those units, but there are uh, more different options available as well. And we hope to be able to come and introduce those additional units um, at later webinars too. So there are four different study options for analytical chemistry and measurement science, which starts with CPD, which is continuing professional development, where you study individual units. And you can also work your way through and work up to either a postgraduate certificate, postgraduate diploma or the full MSc. So that depends on the type of qualification that you want, depends on the number of units that you want to study. Study routes are flexible with this programme, so if you were to start off by studying just the CPD, perhaps just one unit to see how you're finding studying online and alongside um, working full time or perhaps starting with something like the postgraduate certificate, there is the option to then later transfer onto something like the postgraduate diploma or the full master's degree as well. So we have um, a wide range of units. Obviously, we featured a few of those today and each of those units run at different times in each academic year. What I've done is I've just put into the chat for everyone um, more um, links to where you can find out more information. And that includes our course brochure where you can see the time of year that each of our course units is next running. And um, you will study if you're studying for um, what the master's or the postgraduate diploma or the postgraduate certificate each unit um, is you study them one at a time and that's so that it's manageable with, alongside full-time work and these units last for 10 weeks each during those 10 weeks you access your learning materials online and you work towards the deadlines outlined at the start of each unit everything is coursework based um, in our units as well. So there's the, not the need to be set, sitting an exam at a particular time like the, the, there might have been if when you've been studying undergraduate courses. Those people who go on to study a master's, you once you've completed all of the taught units, you then move on to studying the research project. So there are three options for the research project and the option number one is probably the option that most students will go for, which is studying a project with your current employer. So that's where it means you can tailor your project to your current area of work and your current area of expertise. Alongside um, your industrial supervisor, be someone who you work closely with, um, you will also gain support from the University of Manchester with an academic supervisor. And one thing just to highlight as well is that we do understand the need that in some industries um, you might have need for confidentiality. And if there is the need for a confidentiality clause to be built into your project, then that is absolutely something that we can accommodate as well. And just you just need to get in contact with us and let us know what those needs are when you come to choosing your research project. Option two is to um, is a computational or theoretical project. And the option there is to study it online. So that's more suitable for students who are unable to take a practical project due to their work or other commitments. Perhaps you, you're about to change jobs and it's just not practical for you to start one project with your current employer and move to another employer. 
Um, because of the additional um, support you're gaining from the University of Manchester during that time, there is just an additional fee of £1,000 as well. And then the final option is to study the project at the University of Manchester. So you can gain support from an academic supervisor, work alongside PhD students using the state-of-the-art instruments and experience the research that takes place physically here in Manchester. Again, because you're um, coming to Manchester, you're coming to use our equipment, our resources, you'll be gaining full support from an academic supervisor. There's the additional fee there of £3,000. And just to make that clear, that doesn't cover the expenses like travel or accommodation as well. So during the research project, um, you'll be really embedding that training that you've been doing during your master's and choosing a topic that's relevant um, relevant to you. So typical areas and options for study would be things like chromatography, HPLC, mass spectrometry, atomic absorption, um, IPC, molecular spectroscopy, magnetic resonance, X-ray techniques and data analytics. So if there are other topics that you're interested in studying as part of the, um, the research element of the course, um, what we can do is we, we work to accommodate that with you, but we ask you to get in contact um, with us and have that discussion with um, Professor John Walther, who is unfortunately unable to join us today. So that brings me to the end of our um, main presentations. Um, so if you do have any questions that you want to ask any of our panel today, then please do submit those using the Q&A function. Um, and yeah, that just brings me to the end of the presentation. So just while we're waiting um, for any questions to be submitted, um, Nick, I noticed in your presentation you hadn't mentioned um, a huge amount about the different types of assessments um, that separation science covers. Would you be able to give us a bit more detail on that, please? Sure. Yeah. So in separation science, um, there are two uh, multiple choice online tests um, that are towards the front end of the course within the first, I think, six weeks. Um, more on the kind of fundamentals and the theory. So these are randomised online multiple choice quizzes. Um, and then um, following some formative uh, assessment and feedback, you then get a summative assessment on your PRACI, which is choosing a research article of, of your choice relevant to the unit, of course, um, and then writing a, a short summary of that. Um, and then the other piece of assessment is um, a lab based, a virtual lab based exercise. So you essentially would do a uh, a virtual lab following a, a script using the simulation software and then write that up and, and present that. So those are the main um, forms of assessment. So a, a, a variety and they're all supported by formative pieces of assessment where you get um, feedback and in tutorials we also discuss um, the kind of formative feedback to, to attempts that you've made. Great, thank you. So I can see we've had a um, question submitted here um, relating to the MSc by research. Um, so just to just to make you aware, um, today's presentations um, and everything that we've been discussing with different units relate to a postgraduate taught program, which is the Analytical Chemistry and Measurement Science course. So MSc by Research is a separate program. If you've already applied or you have questions about it, um, you would need to um, send an email to pg.chemistry at manchester.ac.uk um, and that's the team that look after that and they will be able to support you further with those questions. Um, so the other thing that we do get asked a lot is about um, funding and payment options um, for this course. So at the moment we do have an, uh, we do have an early application discount in place for the programme and that is um, if you submit an application by Monday, you can save 10% on your save 10% on your tuition fees. In addition to that, there is also an alumni discount that is in place. Um, and that is again, a, that's a saving of 10%. So if you are interested in um, study, if you've studied with us previously and gained a qualification from the University of Manchester, you can still save 10% on your fees, even if you have applied um, after that early application deadline. 
Um, I can see somebody's raised their hand um, there. Can you type your question either into the chat or the Q&A, please? And then we'll be able to support you with that. Um, the other funding options that people often ask about is you can be sponsored either fully or partially by your employer. And if you do want any further information about that, then you can email me at studyonline at manchester.ac.uk and I'm happy to arrange a conversation with you to discuss your specific um, specific case. Um, OK, so we've got the next question here. Um, so are we able to link? Uh, sorry, we've just had three questions at the same time. Um, are we able to link ICP OES with ion um, chartography for detecting halogens, or is that not recommended to couple two different instruments? Is anybody able to take that, or shall we follow that one up after today's session? I think we follow that up probably offline. Basically. Yeah, so okay. that's absolutely um, fine. It's it, it can be done, sorry is the answer, but I think we should follow that up on the Yeah, okay, that's absolutely fine. Um, so there's been a question about different scholarships that are available. If you use the link to the course, um, if you use a link to the course web page, we have a full list of the scholarships that are on offer for this course. Um, and those I'll place that um, in the chat again for you. Um, so the, the specific scholarships do vary depending on different people's individual circumstances. Um, so and there is a fees and funding section on our website, scholarships that specifically relate to this program. Um, you'll be able to um, you'll be able to find out more on those. And if you do have any further questions afterwards, you can email me at studyonline at manchester.ac.uk um, and I'll be able to send you further information. Um, OK, and so the next question we have is about how the course is structured weekly. Um, is there a designated day per week or does that change? Um, so for the most part, um, you will be working through each of the units at your own pace. Um, and so you have those 10 weeks, those 10 week blocks that you're learning those units in and you work through those at your own pace to um, to complete the learning materials. There's a guide in our virtual learning environment where it's week one, week two, week three. But the most important thing is that you're, you're trying to keep to that as much as possible. Maybe one week you're slightly ahead. So you start the, the week two learning during week one, um, but then week two is actually quite busy for you. So then you're back on track by the end of it. You can work through those at your own time. But the most important thing is that you're meeting those deadlines. There are tutorials as part of those. Um, there are tutorials as part of each of the units. Um, I will ask uh, my academic colleagues, do you have particular days that you run your tutorials or can they vary depending um, depending throughout the unit? Yep. So I tend to do my tutorials on the same day um, every week that I do them. There are six uh, in, in mine and there's also presentations. Um, I think the presentations are likely to, to move to video format in, in the near future. But I tend to have my tutorials at the same time um, and UK time that tends to be five. There's people joining from, from all over the world. So that, that tends to be quite a good time for everyone. Um, I think in, in future years, because of the number of applicants, it's likely that we will have both um, you know, tutorials scheduled at time zones that suit uh, the, the working lives of, of people um, joining. Um, but, but for me, at least, it, the tutorials tend to be on, all on the same day. Yeah. Yeah, and in separation science, they tend to be on the same day, um, usually a Friday. Um, and usually at the same time. So I'm, I'm very aware that depending on where you are in the world, that may not be as convenient as it is for others. Um, so as Ferdy says, uh, as the cohort grows, um, we, we may offer um, alternative times or kind of group tutorials such that people in different parts of the world can join at um, 
uh, at times convenient for those. But those tutorials are also recorded. So although you don't have the benefit of, of joining in and, and participating, contributing, if, if you're only watching the recorded material, you at least gain some benefit from watching them back. Yep, and Mike, Drupad, did you have anything extra that you wanted to add at all? Um, tutorials for, for my, um, the, we have uh, four tutorials and they um, there is some flexibility in the timing, but um, like Purdy, we try to keep it um, as flexible to the to the working hours of the cohort, um, depending if they're inter how international it is. Same for mine, we use our first tutorial time to decide when the other three should be. So it's pretty democratic and we try and fit the tutorial time. It is fixed, but we try and fix it so that everyone can attend. Yeah, that's brilliant. And I guess the other thing as well, it's worth making um, everyone aware of is that, you know, during your studies, you have access to the virtual learning environment with all of those learning materials there's discussion boards on there. So if there is a question you want to ask, you can perhaps put it on there, but you also have a University of Manchester email address. And so if you do have a specific question that, that you want to ask and you want to check, there is the option to send, send an email and ask that question outside of those specific tutorials if you feel that that's necessary as well. Um, Okay, so I think that that covers, um, I think that that actually covers most of the questions that we've had asked today. Um, so I've just got one more, um, a couple of quick questions for you. Um, if anybody after today's webinar would like to find out more about the course or wants to book a one-to-one -one consultation with me to discuss your eligibility to study the programme in more detail, um, then if you fill in the short poll, then I will get in touch with you after today's webinar. Um, but other than that, that really brings today's session to a close. Um, so I just want to say thank you to everybody in our audience for attending today. Um, and thank you to Mike, Purdy, Nick and Drupad as well for introducing yourselves and your units so well as well. If you do have any further questions that you would like to ask, then you can email studyonline at manchester.ac.uk um, where either myself or another member of our course advisor team will be able to support you um, and guide you through with those questions. Um, but thanks very much for attending everyone. <laughs>